if Yip Man himself was not the Grand Master, and uh, that does not equal he was not the best. The title itself does not grant you any special skill. Even if you do have great skill, that does not make you a great teacher. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Wing Chun by Design podcast. So I'm really looking forward to today's episode. It's a three-person episode today. First time shooting it here at the Academy. And to my left, I've got Stefan. And to my right, I've got Brendan. Hi guys, how are you? Good morning, Stefan. Hey, Stefan, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Um, really excited for today's episode because we're going to have an interesting conversation. Uh, a lot of people in the Wing Chun community don't know that our late... Grandmaster Yip Man was not actually a grandmaster uh, in the sense that in the old days, in Kung Fu lineages and Kung Fu families, there was always the grandmaster. And that was per the person that was actually <clears throat> bestowed upon them the title of style keeper, right? Uh, the person that was in charge of the clan or the lineage. And as we all know, the uh, Sifu that Yip Man had in uh, mainland China in Fatsan was Chan Wan Shun, and he was the Grand Master. He was a title holder. He received it from his Sifu and uh, Long Zhan. And from then onward, so as we all know, history shows that Yip Man was his last disciple. And uh, then soon after he started his training, his formal training, the Sifu died. And before he died, he passed on the lineage or the title of Grand Master to his son, not to Yip Man. So it's interesting to know this fact because when Yip Man fled China and went to Hong Kong, not for his studies, but as an adult, uh, we all know that he established his uh, Wing Chun school in Hong Kong. And uh, a lot of people within his... Uh, tight circle wanted him to be and become or the grandmaster for the Wing Chun lineage mm -hmm. at least they would um, try to convince him to have the title for the Hong Kong branch of Wing Chun but Yip Man was a very traditional old school person and very much into respect loyalty and the traditions within the Chinese culture uh, of Wing Chun Kung Fu and he never accepted that title because he knew he was not given that title by his Sifu and nowadays it seems like every other person is a Grand Master. Yeah. Now how about we just first dive into the difference between I guess Grand Master the title holder and Grand Master the Sifu's Sifu. Right. The Sikong. Okay. The Sikong. Right, and also Grand Master, all one word, instead of Grand Master, two separate words. Okay. So I do understand and validate people that have been training an art form for decades and, you know, 40, 50, 60 years practicing and dedica dedicating their lives to, in this case, Wing Chun. Should they be called a grandmaster? Of course, yeah, why not? I mean, if you've, let's say your students have become masters themselves, then you are a master of a master, or you're the master's master, sure, grandmaster. And plus, you're, you know, in Chinese uh, tradition, you have your Sifu and you have your Sikong. Once you are, you know, become a Sikong, when your student became a Sifu themselves, then automatically you become that Sikong. But I think a lot of people nowadays are milking the title like there's no tomorrow just to build themselves up and, I guess, gain more followers, get more students. Uh, what do you guys think of the title, the position, the credentials, Wing Chun in general nowadays? I think it's interesting how Ip Man saw it as one. Like, So he acknowledged that it, you know, his Wing Chun was not separate to the one in China, so he couldn't accept the It was title. one family. One family, and now there's multiple families, and especially 
from Yip Man's side, or oh, his lineage, there's a lot of different grandmasters, and they all sort of um, take that, take the mantle of grandmaster when he wasn't willing to, to. You know, they see themselves as separate. Unfortunately, the Wing Chun community. A lot of people will say it's a large community because there are many practitioners all over the world, but unfortunately it's broken into smaller subgroups. Uh, I don't know if it's something that's got to do with the culture, how Wing Chun was taught originally, say from the Hong Kong side, mm. where you know I possess the true knowledge, you don't. I'm the chosen one. I mean, we've heard time and time again, we won't go into names, but I'm sure everyone in the Wing Chun community uh, know the story of a few people here and there where they proclaim they are the only inheritor of the true Yip Man system. Well, if we go back to what we were saying initially, if Yip Man himself was not the grandmaster and uh, that does not equal he was not the best. Right. There's two separate things here. One is uh, your skill as a practitioner. All right, let's, let's go back a bit. The title itself does not grant you any special skill. That just comes from hard work. And second, even if you do have great skill, that does not make you a great teacher. Right. And a lot of people piggyback on stories and myths. And uh, unfortunately, when people pass away, they put them in a pedestal. Right. And we see it happen time and time again. Even nowadays, they've got, you know, another Wing Chun master that passed away years ago on a pedestal. Like, oh, he was the greatest and this and that. It's like... Let's get real. Uh, I love this martial arts system. I have a passion for it. I've dedicated my whole life to learning it as best as possible and researching and studying, training and teaching it. But we have to keep things real like we've discussed in past episodes. Number one, the title, is it important? In my opinion, not so much. Number two, what is important in my opinion is how good the Sifu knows his material. Right. Okay? And can that person transmit that knowledge to the student? Is th because there's one thing where the Sifu may not even be a good teacher, and then there's a whole different other side of things where Sifus won't teach you because they find that you're maybe not worthy of what that person has to teach. So I know I'm going in all different directions, but it all has to do more or less with the same thing. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting because you can be... One, it's one thing to become proficient as a martial artist, but then to be a Sifu and be able... To, it's not just teaching one person. For your, your philosophy and your, what you're trying, trying to transmit, you have to have multiple students carry on that message with different ability, physical ability and capacity and different mentalities. So, you know, it's, it's, you know now in the modern time, we, we have a lot of exposure to education on terms of how to teach. And sometimes people back then, they were taught, they pretty much taught how they were taught. And their ability could have got them there, but the science of being able to teach, do you know what, I, what I'm getting back? Yeah, so you, other, so it, it narrows the capacity to have elite. And also a couple things. Number one, I can say it firsthand in my own experience as a Sifu, you get better with time because you can recognize things, you can see where there's room for improvement and if you're like me, I always, always strive to get better. So I'm reading the books, you right. know, I'm reading the books on psychology, on teaching methodologies, on uh, coaching athletes and, you know, where people may spend their times reading on 
technique or something like I've got my sifu for that. Mm. And I've got my own training and my own understanding and my own common sense. Right. So if I want to teach, I want to get better at teaching. And that comes, you know, with time. Yeah. Uh, you don't get stuck in the past. And also, see, Chinese martial arts is heavily, of course, influenced by the Chinese culture. And because I've uh, experienced in my travels and everything, I can see other Kung Fu masters, not only in Wing Chun, in other styles, where the mindset of the Sifu is, you better be happy you're in my class. Right? Yes. You are here because of me, right? My reputation. And I will teach you how I see fit yeah. and go ahead and do a horse dance for half an hour and then I'll see if you're worthy of my teachings. Right. Is it good or is it bad? It's not up to me to decide. It's a free will, you can do whatever you like. Where in other parts of the world, and for example, my mindset is that the person comes here, I need to see how well I can help them. Uh, some people misunderstand the word serve, okay? Um, they may think uh, like I'm less if I'm trying to serve my students. Yes. Uh, I don't see it that way because I see it almost like when you go to the doctor or to the dentist, you're there because you need help, hmm. right? So you're there for the dentist or the doctor to help you as best as possible. I see it that way. Yeah. So how can I help this person that just came in? Whether it's a child, a teen, adult, male, female, I'm here to help them become a better version of themselves through Wing Chun Kung Fu, right? So if you tackle it that way, then it's a completely different perspective, Yeah. right? So I will meet you in the middle. I will put what I have and you have to put in time, effort, practice, patience, loyalty, honor, respect, and we meet in the middle and we can have a fantastic relationship and you'll blossom and you'll go to great heights. I see it that way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, go ahead. So that teaching practice and stuff like that, how do we get, how do we get to this notion of Ip Man not accepting the position of grandmaster and how, you know, the, the confusion with that title? Like, well, for, for him, it's not important. Right. Like if you know who you are, if you walk into a room yeah. and you see not only martial arts circles, but you see the person that tries to draw the most attention is usually the weakest person in the room. Right. The person that has the most confidence, right. he or she, they don't need to draw the attention. The attention draws to them automatically. Yeah. Call it energy, call it charisma, call it whatever it is. So even your Sikung, my Sifu, you both know this. When you meet him, he is as real as it gets. Yeah. He does not need to sell you anything. You're there in the room because you know who he is. Right. And you know what he has to offer. Other people, uh, it's almost like in the old days, it's handshake, here's my business card. Right. So Trying it's like to, a marketing. Of course. Marketing themselves. And is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's not for me to decide, but yeah, that a lot of people in the Wing Chun community build their whole careers piggybacking on Bruce Lee. Right. And then once they get to uh, a certain level of recognition or call it fame, then they bag Bruce Lee. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, well, I taught him. Or oh, Bruce Lee didn't complete the system. Bruce and... Lee didn't complete the system. I did. Right. And Yip Man secretly, yeah. you know, told me that I was the inheritor and I could only teach when he passed away. Right. That seems to be the most common tag I've noticed. True. I'm the true Yip Man Wing Chun. You know, well. and, and the yeah. thing is, the, there's two ways you can prove this. One, like a gentleman sit down, let's discuss, let's talk about it, let's talk theory. Why do you do your tansel this way? There's a, there are, I mean, there's a 
quick question you can ask people and they'll give you all sorts of different answers. Yep. Even Yip Man's own two sons that were involved in Winter and War One passed away. But, you know, when you're doing the wooden dummy form and you do the opening and you step and you do the bong sao, which is technically a kwan sao. People do it like this. People do it like that. Well, if you're listening to us on, uh, on your podcast channel, all I'm doing is just stepping, uh, moving to the side and doing like a bong sao uh, movement. Some people jam it. Some people lift it. Some people flick it. Mm. Can you explain to me why? Yeah. What's the application? Not ah oh, this that or no. How do you use that in a fighting application? Let us not forget that Wing Chun is a fighting system. Mm. How do you use that in a fight? Yeah. Or the opening of every uh, empty hand form, Po Jong, right? Low height. What do you use that for? Yeah. And some people are not even, you know, some people fully extend the arms. Now people are going with elbows completely bent. When you do a Tan Sao, do you keep the elbow in, in line with your nipple? Do you keep it in, in line with what people, you know, call the center line? Are you keeping the wrist and elbow on the same line? Mm. Or is it a little bit off where the wrist is on the center and the elbow is in line with your nipple? So that's how you can discuss yeah. Wing Chun. And between friends, you can, you know, respectfully say you agree, you disagree, we do it this way, we do it, no problems. If we go back to looking at this as a whole, we're all in this together, we're all from the same Wing Chun branch or Wing Chun family, all good. And the second way to verify things, well, okay, let's test it. Yeah. You do your version, I'll do my version, and let's, let's see which one works. Right. Simple as that, end of discussion. Do you possess this? Do you do that? That doesn't matter. means nothing, yeah. It means nothing, nothing if you can't back it up, right? In terms of theory, understanding, philosophy, and all this. And, then, and, and guys, let's, let's get real. How long did people learn from Yip Man? It's right? unknown, yeah. No, I mean... How long the, did he teach? See, some people were with him, training, call it full-time, yeah. five years. Right. Others, six, seven years. Others, three years. Let's say the longest was, I don't know, 10 years. Right. You guys already are with me longer than that. Yeah. And how long have they been teaching? The ones that are still alive. Right. 60 years, yeah. 50 years, 40 years. So there goes to show that whatever a great Sifu is teaching is also part of his understanding of the principles of theory and their own fighting experience. How, what they were exposed to during their, call it prime. Yep. That, uh, that is what most people are learning nowadays. Yep. So if your understanding was very poor or you weren't taught to think of what's being taught, that's how systems, not only martial arts, but things in general, start to decline. Right. And then what is presented 30, 40, 50 years later into the future is far off from the original idea or the, re the original concept. Right. And right. Um, the thing is, like, also, it's it, it has to sort of evolve with the times. Like, if you're like it, it man, he, you know, you got the the foundation and the structure of the style, but then you have to apply it against different people, different uh, body, you know, body types, Styles. different power generations. Yeah. So then you have to test it and see, oh, does this work? Do, does, the, the, does the style, how do I apply it against these different opponents? Because maybe they were exposed to different stuff 50, 60 years ago. It's not maybe, that's a fact. Yeah. Nowadays, the world is completely different. Now it's open, yeah. right? People back in the day, some of them, you know, barely saw someone practice on a wooden dummy. Yeah. Nowadays, you click on YouTube and you got hundreds, if not thousands of people working on the wooden dummy. Whether they're doing it right or wrong, that's discussion for a later date. 
So now the world is completely open. Now people are traveling, going, practicing, being exposed to different martial arts. You click on, you know, some streaming channel and you watch fight from this style, from that style. And then, of course, you start to wonder or question or think, and how can I use what I'm learning against this? Or if I'm exposed to that. And that's good. That's yeah. how... You know, martial arts in general, Wing Chun and every other martial art out there has to evolve with time, just like technology nowadays with your phones and everything. Every six months, it's obsolete almost. There's a new model coming out because everything's happening so fast. So for someone to believe that, you know, something from a couple hundreds of years ago, this and that, and if you don't test it, I'm not saying that technique from the past don't work. Of course they work. If you test it, you tweak it, you, you, you adapt, you, I don't want to use the word modify because I know a lot of people use the term that modified is like the, the negative side of, of Wing Chun and just the uh, traditional or whatever, that's yeah. the correct version. But you have to test it, you have to see and, and think. And because it's the context that's important. Like it, you can't, because I, a lot of the time there's, people that say oh um this is not this is not authentic this is not traditional because they see it as something different but they're not seeing the context of the application like yeah and like what we discussed last time uh with brendan if you can trace every technique let's just talk about our videos and our technique if you can trace everything that we do to the forms then end the discussion that's wing chun uh, when you watch our videos and you see people attacking with round kicks or back heel hawks and whatever, we are training using our Wing Chun to defend ourselves against what we're going to experience. Potentially what we could. Different attacks. Or, yeah, that's it. Because if I'm all day long just working on, you know, defending against a vertical punch, I may get really good at that. But then the chances of someone attacking me that way are very slim, slim to none. And also... If you're spending all your time just doing chisa and chisa, I love chisa, like it's awesome and I, it's very enjoyable and there's a lot of benefits to doing chisa, but you can't spend all your time doing that thinking that you're gonna get good as a fighter. If you just wanna do that because you wanna be a great chisa player, then go ahead. Mm. Um, anyway, so guys, today's episode, I think we went in all different directions. <laughs> But hey, it's uh, still, uh, I think, a positive conversation for people out there to listen, to watch, and just create a conversation because we're not trying to talk down on anyone. Um, in my particular case, I don't think I possess, you know, the absolute truth. This is just three people having a conversation who are passionate about Wing Chun and uh, think it's pretty awesome and... I think it helps people live a better life, to be honest. Yeah. And um, that's it for today, guys. I appreciate you joining me in this episode. Brendan, Stefan, thanks. thank you. Thanks, Sifu. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching and listening. If you have any comments, make sure you let us know, and we'd like to uh, tackle them at a future date. See everyone. Thanks. Bye. Okay, guys, so that's it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please click the like button, share it with a friend. And guys, don't forget to check out some of my other videos. There's plenty of material there to keep you busy training and taking your Wing Chun to the next level. If you haven't already, check out my online academy. It's umauniversity.com.au. There's a free introductory applied Wing Chun course you can check out and learn from those videos as well. Having said that, I'll see you in the next one.